Assalamu alaikum and welcome to our brand new show on Imam Hussain TV, Making a House a Home, with myself, Ragat Bakar, and the expert life coach and NLP practitioner Fahima Muhammad, who today will be discussing how to practically apply the teachings of Ahl Bayt within our daily lives when raising young children into adults. Assalamu alaikum Fahima. Alaikum salam. Can you start off by telling us what the teachings of the Ahl Bayt are? and how they can be applied when raising our children into adults. <coughs> uh, of course, um, the teachings of the Ahl al-Bayt is very, very simple. We all um, address that every year in Muharram. Okay. And the main teachings, and I would say that we have, is the love. The love that we have for our households, the love that we have and we bring to each of our family members. And I think that is very vital and very important for us to not just show that when we are, you know, in the processions, in the majalis, mm. but to actually bring it home. The love. The, the love. The teaching of love. The actual love of it. And the thing is, um, that brings upon the strength, that brings about so many different issues of compassion and empathy and understanding. So when we are looking at each other as our you know, siblings, partners, spouses, we have that sort of um, way of thinking mm -hmm. because it will address the way in which we respond to each other, how we react to each other, and it all comes from love. Sacrifice as well. Absolutely. Um, selflessness. So exactly. Like that, you know, that's what we hear a lot in the majalis. Of course. You know, but the thing is, we, we go there, you know, as a ritual a lot of the times. Mm. And we go there as, you know, just as mourners and just as remembering, mm -hmm. which is all fair and well. But if you really want to take it to the next level and to bring it into our everyday lives, it's not just to go there and then come out of it in a different light, but actually take it home. Yeah. And bring it to your yeah. family. I think what a lot of people forget or do is they, they call themselves mourners. So they'll mourn for Imam Hussein. Yes. That's what he done. He sacrificed. He yes. loved. And he was selfless. They don't think that maybe we should learn from that and be that ourselves, do they? Well, the thing is, um, Imam Hussein, you know, was not just a role model for our Islam, you know, Shia. It was for entire world. There's mm -hmm. so many followers. And why mm -hmm. is that? There's mm -hmm. so many reasons for it. And, it, you know, that's why we, I think, we take the limited version. Mm -hmm. Because we feel that, you know, we're just doing it because it's a ritual, like I said before. And I think that we are missing the opportunity right there mm -hmm. to actually um, use him as a role model. Yeah. And to actually, you know, we all say to be successful in life, even in psychology and in business, we have mm -hmm. to sort of mirror our role models. Mm -hmm. And what better way than the teachings of the Ahl al-Bayt, you yeah. know, with regards to how they were so, you know, selfless, even in the most testing and challenging times. Yes. So those are the great, you know, things to take away and apply that in your daily lives. So when we're going through sort of struggles, when we're mm -hmm. going through problems, we easily can get carried away with this day and age, thinking that it's modern, even though Islam accepts certain rules and regulations. But actually, if you mm. look at the teachings and how they lived in those times, if we had more empathy, more sympathy for each other and one another, mm. and bring upon compassion instead of just complaining and you know never having enough and always wanting more, then you know our households and our communities will be a lot more stronger. Yeah. Yeah, and if we teach our children as well to be so, so, so selfless um, with each other, then that can help them to grow up to be that much of a better person. I hear you saying yeah. the word selfless. A lot, because, because that was the main thing. And you know, today, um, it's so common to be narcissist. <laughs> <laughs> so it's exactly yeah. it's That's not just about that. posting online about yourself mm. but it's yeah. actually the whole concept the mind about me that yeah. even parents themselves are not even taking consideration of their wives and children or their husbands and they they just thinking that they're going to move forward and succeed in life mm. because they're just going to put themselves first okay. and you call yourself a Shia you call yourself a follower and if this is how your concept is and this is mm -hmm. your way of living, then obviously look at your life and see that obviously it's not going yeah. anywhere for those reasons. Mm -hmm. So that's really important. And we are struggling in the community today mm -hmm. with all the technology, with yeah. all the knowledge, with all the advancements, because the essence is not being taught. The yeah. psyche is not in our homes. That's why we're not even teaching our children the proper way. We're just making them go there, dress in black, you know, uh, recite what they need to, you know, perform the nasheeds and have the best voices. But at the same time, are we actually living it? Yeah, so I think it's probably time to go back to basics and raise our children.
by the teachings of the Ahl al-Bayt. Yeah, and what are the teachings of the Ahl al-Bayt? Yeah. You know, it's very simple. You know, besides the love, you know, it's about, like you said, the, the compassion. It's about being selfless. It's about putting the other person first. And you, whoever you may be, the husband, the wife, you know, you have to give 100%. Mm -hmm. Not depending on what the other person does, but just the fact that that's your values and that's mm -hmm. your belief. Mm -hmm. Whatever your surrounding is, whatever your circumstances, whatever your situation is, you have got to represent your values and your beliefs. So we've got to look at ourselves. As, um, as parents especially, we have to understand what do we represent. Yeah. And we only know that if we actually learn what are the mm -hmm. teachings, mm -hmm. what are each and every imam, you know, bringing to, uh, to help us, you know, to actually overcome whatever challenges that we have. How do they look at their challenges and how do they overcome it? Mm -hmm. And in, in our day, it's so easy to sort of get carried away with such simple things and make it so big. Yeah. So when our children see us raising concerns, which is not important, and then we complain that, you know, they're not being raised and we have troubled some teenagers. It's only because they're reflecting us. Yeah. I think that the ultimate um, lesson you can learn from the imams, as, we, as, as well as the selflessness, is sacrifice. And that's what a lot of people dismiss. No one does life. that today. And it's always, it's even the small things you can sacrifice. Just sacrifice what you want uh, for something else that exactly. the whole family want, or your brother would want, or your sister would want. So it's just a simple, simple things. Um, people are not willing to sacrifice anymore. No. Even parents are not willing to sacrifice no, their own children. Yes. And then when the adult, when the child turns into an adult and he's not willing to sacrifice some of his time to come and see his family or his parents, the parents are um, confused as to why this has happened or yeah. why their child's turned out that way. I mean, Islam teaches to, to respect your parents, to be good to your families mm -hmm. and this and that. And, you know, we teach our children these things by verbally, you know, expressing it to them. But at the same time, we've got to show them that. Mm -hmm. You want them to respect you, you show respect. You want them mm -hmm. to love you, you show love. Mm -hmm. You want them to really have high regard for you, then you have to have those sort of values within yourself. So when they look mm -hmm. for trustworthiness, they yeah. see it in their, in their parents. Yeah. They know that their parents never lie. They know that their parents, when they make a promise, they keep it. You know, things like that. Mm. So when they have strong values uh, within the foundations of that yeah. household, then, and which is carried, you know, from the teachings of the Ahl al-Bayt, then, mm. then only they themselves will mirror that in their own lifetime. And, if, and no one's saying we're going to get perfect children. They're going to make mistakes, but, but they're going to know that it's actually right or wrong. And they're going to come back out of that, you know, knowing that we need to correct ourselves. And we're there to support them as parents, to help them, you know, um, raise that awareness and, you know, keep them interested, knowing that this is the path that they have to follow. Mm -hmm. But we have to follow that first as parents. And even a message to parents, even if the child doesn't turn out the way that you, you'd want them to, um, the fact that you have done all these, you've, you've Taken followed the steps. all these steps yeah. and you've done your best, and you follow the teachings of the Holy Bait, at least if they do turn out differently, you can't blame yourself to a certain extent. But to extent. be fair, you know, um, you, there's so much hope when you actually mm. follow up the Ahl al Bayt that it will not, uh, uh, you know, it will never go that way. Yeah. You will not go wrong. But just a reassurance. You know, yes. you will not go, th yeah. you know, because when you're a believer, and even now in Muharram, you know, when people go to Karbala and they're mm. actually there because they want to, they know the miracle, they know what it means to ask for something. And it's all fair and well to say that, you know, we're going there to ask for something, but it starts from here. You have to set the, the standard by being a certain way first. What am I doing that's not getting me what I want? When you're reading your salah, when you're giving charity, when you're performing certain things that we have to do, are we doing it wholeheartedly or are we just ticking the boxes? Mm -hmm. You know, are we just seeing our kids and our parents that everyone can see that this is what we're doing and we can speak about it when we're talking generally? When you're in Salah, it should really be like meditation. It should be so revitalizing. Mm. But do we actually feel that afterwards because we don't give ourselves even a minute before to reflect that this is our intention? Mm. So things like that. It only mm. takes sometimes a few seconds to sit in your Salah before you actually perform it, to actually take you know, control of yourself and to focus that this is what I'm doing with the intent of love, not because it's said and you know, put upon me. Mm. You know, all we carry when we go away is our good deeds, but our good deeds come from our intentions, and our intentions has to be from our heart, which is pure. 
And even though we're given free will and good, you know, free choices, there's consequences for our choices. And we can only make the right choices if we have the right values and beliefs. We don't understand our values and beliefs because we are conforming to society. We're conforming to what the community says instead of the real belief. The Ahl al-Bayt was there years ago, but what they stand for and what they represent, people even in today's day and age with the modern psychology, I can reflect to it to say that that's actually what was taught then, but we're naming it differently. So you're talking about intentions, uh, yes. Alia. Um, is it a good idea to share our intentions and our thoughts, the good intentions and the good thoughts with our children? You were saying just before Salah or uh, before a good deed. Is that, would, would that be a good idea? It's, it's all about your timing and how, how old your kids are. Mm. You know, it doesn't have to be every day, but it's good to do that, absolutely. Mm. It's good to show that you can speak out loud. It's not just du'a that you're reading. It's actually you speaking to Allah. You're speaking, you know, with the real love and feeling because then the children will understand it a lot better mm. and they themselves will feel it. Yeah, because the reason I ask this is because you see a lot of parents who are so pious and so close to Allah, um, yet they seem so far away from their children because um, they probably, I'm not sure what, what they think, but they probably feel that uh, they just want to get close to Allah so they have less time to speak to their children. Not really sure what goes on, but you do see a lot of families like that, don't you? Well, that's lack of understanding. Mm -hmm. You know, we can be close to Allah, but if you have to be close to Allah, you have to seek knowledge. And seeking knowledge is, you know, you want to get close to Allah, then you get close to the Prophet and the family, peace be upon him and his family. You get close to knowing what exactly they represented, how they loved their family. Family is such a blessing. People do not understand the meaning of it. Mm -hmm. You know, people separate all the time, people have conflict, people have, sac you know, uh, sort of like struggles within marriages. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, if you knew the blessing of what a family brings, you'll never, ever let that go. Mm -hmm. Because that's the strength that the Ahlul Bayt had, even mm -hmm. in small numbers, which they carried. And that's why we're carrying that forward today. Because of, you know, the, the love that they had for each other, the loyalty and the mm -hmm. commitment just because you've said something years ago doesn't mean it's broken because you feel differently tomorrow or the years la later on. That brings us back to sacrifice and exactly. selflessness. Mm. You know, sometimes what you want is something else, but you've got your family now. And that's what y your priority, that's what you need to concentrate, yeah. that's what you need to nurture. So that's where, that's where the sacrifice and the selflessness comes in. And people it? complain all the time they're not mm. getting the right job, they're not getting the amount of finance that they want, they're not having the most happiest, fulfilled lives. But even research have shown um, in studies that, you know, people in L.A. compared to people in Calcutta, for example, living in the slums can have the same level of happiness. And why is that? Because the people in Calcutta have at least the value of family within them, mm. you know. Mm. So it just goes to show that, you know, it's not about having success as in like materialistic things. It's the family. It's the people that you turn to. It's the people that you can trust and so give yeah. you support and safety and this is what the Ahlul Bayt teaches when you're bringing children into the world you've got to give them that it's not just providing materialistic things it's not even giving them you know the secular education it's giving them the Islamic education and it's not just sending them to Arabic school mm. Arabic school is just an icing on the cake yeah. you have to practice that at home every day yeah yeah, a lot of a lot of parents do th feel those that four hours is enough to their Arabic to the Arabic school is going to give them all the Islamic teachings that the child absolutely needs. Absolutely not. No. People don't realize that our religion is an everyday practice, and it can be even more so with the right ways, with today's psychology of patience and sacrifice and uh, better relationships. You know, building that even in challenging times, mm -hmm. we don't need to oppose people. We don't have to be horrible to people, even in the most challenging of situations and times. You know, just because you know you think that you're in a particular situation, you can break relationships. It doesn't work that way, and our children see that in us, mm -hmm. and we cannot, you know, say that we Shia and wear the hijab and wear black and stand in front and hold the Imam Hussein flag and on one occasion and then yeah the, the second or third day later after the Ashura you know and go uh, thinking that this is normal life it doesn't work that way no. yeah that's it's a complete con contradiction yes um, we yeah. cannot be hypocritical about the way in which we live as Muslims and the problems that are arising today is because of the breakdown in the family unit and it's more and more. And the family unit is the most important, you know, station that you can build. 
it's the most important foundation for not just your home, but for your community, for even outside communities to actually learn from. Mm -hmm. So you're teaching your neighbors, you're teaching your, you know, your society around you and your environment. You know, things are allowed in Islam, like divorce and lots of other things. But is it right for you? And what are the consequences of and that? And under what circumstances? And under what have? circumstances? Now, people are not willing to even, like you said, sacrifice or even, you know, put other people first because they just want things for themselves because all they see is themselves and then they want success. And years go by and they're still in the same situation. Am I happy? Am I where I want to be? Is this what I want myself? Well, it's not going to happen if your children are not happy. Me, me, yeah. me. Whereas uh, if, if, if the person stops and asks himself, um, will they be happy? Will they be, will they be nurtured? What's the best for them? Exactly. No one really asked that question. The Imams, you know, used to live in times where they used to see their cities destroyed and, you know, their, their families being tortured and the way in which they would respond and the way in which they would react would be so calm, would be, you know, not having not any emotion but holding back their emotion. Mm. Nowadays we have youngsters who love Imam Hussein so much and it's amazing to see that, you know, that strength and the power and that feeling that they have. Mm. But then they go on the street and they'll see someone that doesn't respect the imams or doesn't respect the month of Muharram and they want to fight with them. And that's not the way to behave. Yeah. That's not the teachings. You know, that is obviously a, a very extreme example that I've used, but I have heard it a lot. It happens a lot. And it happens a lot. After the your late attitude, majalis. Yeah. Your attitude should not just be when you're in the majalis. Your attitude should be carried forward when you're mm. even faced with an ignorant person who has no understanding. You give them benefit of the doubt and you actually still nurture them to show them that, you know, this is not what, you know, we represent. Even if they're actually saying that what you're doing is, is laughable, mm. you cannot get angry with them because it's their them. lack of yeah. knowledge, their lack yeah. of understanding. Yeah. And it, it, takes a, it takes a lot of mm. a person to sort of create and build that habit, to sort of control the emotion and that anger because you love Imam Hussein. But then see what the Imams did in those testing times which was worse than what we're facing. And that's the teaching of the Ahlul Bayt. And we can't even go home and be nice to our husbands or nice to our wives or nice to our children after the majalis or help our families mm -hmm. when they're struggling. Mm -hmm. And we follow the Shia and we call ourselves the Shia. That's not how the households should be in today and it should be a lot easier even if better than before to be able to do that we're much more capable yeah and there's not a lot more accessible knowledge as well now absolutely it? but like i so said the knowledge no is there it's not about the knowledge knowledge mm. we can google we can google uh, uh, the whole library if we wanted you know but it's about knowing how to take that knowledge and use it yeah. understanding it properly taking the right meaning from it and not just picking and choosing what you want for the moment as well. Being fair about it, that there might be things that you have to call out on yourselves. Mm -hmm. That, you know, I don't, you know, I'm nice to my, to my peers at work or my colleagues, but when I come home, I'm really rough with the way in which I speak, you know, each other with spouses. And your children see that and they hear that and they think it's okay and that's the way to be. And remember, that's how you, you know, you raise children to adults because they mirror what you, you know, show them. Yeah, the main part of, the, of raising children is how you act. Teenagers are not a problem. They're not a problem at all. Mm -hmm. You know, they are the most, in fact, I think it's easy to t raise teenagers because they have that understanding and that deep meaning mm -hmm. that you can actually interact with them. It's just pe parents don't have the skill. They don't have the mindset. They don't have the psychology. And the psychology is not just about coaching. It's not about NLP. It's um, Islamic teaching. Mm -hmm. And I bring it into NLP and coaching without the Islamic factor in it because it's already been there. You know, having mm -hmm. that positive mindset, having patience, having gratitude, these are all taught in, you know, everyday psychology. Mm -hmm. But we've known this for years, but we still don't use it. Yeah. I mean, you're saying about teenage, uh, teenagers and how a lot of parents don't know how to uh, communicate with teenagers. Um, and it's, it's, it's very simple in Islam. There's the three stages. Absolutely. And it tells us how to communicate with, with each stage. At, uh, the three stages are so. extremely, extremely simple. And it's been said um, that, you know, from naught to seven years old, the child is carefree. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you should really, like, you know, guide them and support them in an area of, you know, bringing awareness mm -hmm. by maybe having Quran in the background, by maybe, maybe having them recite a line or two. But 
only after the age of seven, then they should be the one where they're going to be actually uh, taking orders from parents. They're going to be taking orders from their teachers from the age after of seven? after seven. Okay. Yes. And then from age, say, 15, 16 over is when they're going to be taking on more responsibility. Obviously, there's a lot more to it within yeah. the each stages. Yeah. But even I find in the Arabic schools, they're not even conforming to this because the pressure is put on children under the age of seven to learn things which is beyond their development stage. And even in the English society, in most of European uh, countries which are successful, is only because the children have started school later. Mm. And I know that nowadays parents are working and they want you know, child mind and, you know, they want sort of like the children away from the house mm, to on a Saturday so they can go shopping or have tea mm. and it's another yeah. school day the, for yeah. them. But actually you're missing out on an opportunity. And I'm not saying don't send them to Arabic school, mm. but make sure that the Arabic school is teaching them through play, for example. Yes. They understand the children's development. They understand the mindset. Why put pressure on a four, five, six-year-old to learn surah when they shouldn't really be doing it at that age? And some of them can and some of them can't. But remember what is going to do to them when they themselves are in that young stage, you know, compared to the others, being forced and being stood out and put in a line where they're all reciting and, you know, half of them can and half of them yeah, can't. Comparing, what does it do for them? Uh, yeah. And then they burnt out by the time yeah. they actually need to actually yeah. learn it. Yeah. So we need to, as adults, yeah. as parents, even if you're not a parent, take responsibility as an adult for your community to advise, you know, schools, Arabic schools, the teachers, the curriculum, that, you know, this is the Shia, this is the teaching. Go easy. Mm. You know, go easy because you want them to flourish in the long term, not just for that moment. Yeah. Um, well, we're coming uh, to the end of the first part of the show. Um, hopefully you can tell us more about the three stages because it sounds very interesting of in the next show. Um, and hopefully after the show we'll be taking some of your questions. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the second part of our show, Making a House a Home. Okay, Fahima, so uh, we have some questions coming in from the viewers. Okay. Uh, shall I start off with the first of course, one? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so this is from Sister Ruqayya, and she wants to know, how do we raise our children using the past imam's experience? Well, the past imam's experience was all about, uh, like we discussed earlier, was sacrifice, but also it's mainly about taking a different perspective on the situation that we face. You know, a lot of the times when we're faced with challenges, we sort of say, why is it us? Why is it happening to us? Mm -hmm. And, you know, because we really have a perception of life that everything should go smoothly, mm -hmm. change doesn't happen, we're not faced with testings and, you know, obstacles in life. And I think from an early age, as parents, we want to protect our children, we want to make it like life is full of roses and, you know, and cotton wool, but it's not like that. And the earlier that you can sort of slowly implement that, you know, you're not going to get everything that you want and it's okay. And if you're not going to get what you want and you're going to be faced with challenges, it's not because there's something wrong with you or there's something bad onto you or you're being punished for it. It's just that life is a test. There's a constant saying that life is a test. So mm -hmm. those teachings from the Ahlul Bayt that life is a test is that we have to accept that, you know, this life is going to be tough and we're going to just be tougher. Even when you were faced in school, we are, we are among so many different characters and people that may or may not like us or teachers that may or may not give us what we want mm -hmm. and, you know, faced with all these different challenges. So then the teachings really are about, you know, implementing to your children and expressing to them that this world is just the start, you know, of, of the real world, mm -hmm. the akhira. So you can tell them that, you know, this is a trial, it's a test. But it doesn't mean that you're not going to be, you know, having a wonderful life. But we're going to come across many obstacles in every stage, in every age, so that we need to be ready for it. And what do we do in that sense? Well, the imams, they had patience. They accepted. And they also gave benefit of the doubt to even their enemies. You know, we don't just fight back or we don't just react. We respond and we understand the other side. 
So okay. those things are really important to teach our children from a young age so they become tougher, not just physically, but you know, the mental side of toughness is the most vital mm. for, any, for raising any child. So you used a uh, very important key words here, just accepting, yes. understanding, benefit of the doubts. These are all things that we should teach our children yes. and bring, bring it from the imams and teach it to our children. Absolutely. And again, he said, um, uh, sorry, what you say? Well, when one of the imams was always um, imprisoned, a lot of them were at the time, and we would look at it as, oh, you know, we're not living life, we're not being able to do what we want, but mm -hmm. they used that as an opportunity to actually, um, you know, practice the religion more. They were actually happy. Uh, they were actually saying that one Imam, Imam, the seventh Imam Bakr salam, used to be like, at least now I've got solitude to just praise Allah. Now, do you think in this day and age, if we were put in that situation, we would actually think in that way? Mm. Any sort of obstacle that comes our way, it's a big problem, mm. it's drama, it's why me, we want life to be perfect, and we live every day with those complaints. Negativity rather than yeah. positivity. And yeah. Allah's there to test us in order to bring out the best in us, in order for us to grow. So when we look at trials in, in that light, then you know what, even when they say, you know, with hardship there's ease, it's not after hardship there's ease, it's within that hardship there is ease. Mm -hmm. So you're still going through the problems, but somehow when you believe in Allah and you practice and you have that patience and you have that trust, tawakkul, you have that complete trust that it's, life happens for us not to us then you know within that situation it becomes calming it becomes something that you can actually overcome mm. without even that's the miracle that's the essence of a believer and that should be taught to your children because you need to sit and explain and you need to give them examples of even things that have happened in your lifetime you know mm. with situations in your family and that can actually help them understand depending on the stages that they're at so what kind of acceptance yeah um, okay, I have another question from Sister Fatima, and she said, what is the importance of the lessons of the Ahlul Bayt to our own family homes? To our own family homes, it's about really showing lots of kindness and empathy. We're always picking on each other, especially when we live together for a long time. It's hard. Mm -hmm. You know, when two different people have uh, lived together for five, ten years, you know, it can be boredom, it could be monotonous, it could be even a type, some, some sort of resentment because, you know, one can see the other not putting their weight or, you know, not, you know, being to the level or the standard if one is doing well and the other one is. So, you know, I think it's about always having acceptance, always having the kind of kindness towards one another because when you're in a family constantly seeing each other on a daily basis, that is testing times, mm. that is struggle, and to constantly bring in, you know, that compassion and love and empathy, you're just going to get on each other's nerves. You can't constantly be loving you each other. Can't. Like, can you can't. So you need to know how to separate that. Yes. You need time apart, you need holidays, you need, you know, different types of learning. You need to sort of experience different types of learning and to be grateful for what you have. Mm. Because we're constantly comparing our household to other people's households. And we only see the surface. You know, even what we post and we see on, online, that is just a moment. And that's Everyone, exactly... Yeah. Everyone posts the perfect moment. But that's it's not like that, even in mm. reality. And you think that, oh, that mom is, you know, working and her kids. But when I speak to them personally, one-on-one, -on -one, they're struggling with their children. Or that father, he's doing so well, mashallah, you know, and he's giving his wife everything. And why is my husband not doing that? You know, these things cannot be mm. taken for granted because... Most importantly, we have our health and we have to always remember that. And secondly, we need to remember that we've been given so many opportunities that we don't take. Mm -hmm. And we're teaching our children the most valuable lessons in life and it's moral conduct. And that's being, you know, totally mis, you know, sort of like disregarded, you know, misused. You know, teaching discipline, teaching, you know, respect, teaching how to you know, behave in different situations. These are the things and the lessons that we need to bring to our homes. And telling them stories mm -hmm. of the prophets, of the imams. Telling them stories, not just of the, the general things, of the tragedy. There's so much more to it. There and is. not just in the month of Muharram. Mm -hmm. You've got to continue this throughout the year. You have to learn these things throughout. 
and bring it to your house on a daily basis. There are certain attributes to each imam. Exactly. And we don't know most of them. Most or of our them children don't know. know most of them. Yes. Yeah. So those things are the things that I would say to bring into your house. Mm. You know, talk constantly. And maybe in the month of Muharram, it's probably not even the ideal time because it's, it's very much ritual. Mm. It's very much listening to lectures. But then take away from it during the rest of the months and mm. prepare before that as well and say this is what we're coming towards just like in Ramadan you know people just say it's so difficult to fast because we only start on the first day of Ramadan whereas you've got you know Rajab Sha'ban you know to, to plan to prepare, prepare to even prepare your body with fasting mm. and when you do it you know in advance it becomes so easy in Ramadan it's the same yeah. with Muharram it's the same with anything in life that you do. You have to prepare yourself. So don't look at it. Just like when you go on holiday, you're going to prepare, you're going to buy stuff in advance, you're going to do all of these things. So when it comes to our religion, when it comes to our teaching, when it comes to our learning, when it comes to our raising our children, it's constant preparation, constant organization, constant learning, constant seeking knowledge. When there's an awareness, when there's an interest, you're going to want to actually take the next steps. Even if you don't know how to find it, the answers will come to you. And it will, especially when it's something good, don't tell me that you know your du'a is not going to be answered because you want to raise beautiful children and you want to give them the knowledge. It will come to you. Okay, um, I have a question from a brother, uh, and he wants to know how do we raise our children to respect us as parents? Yeah, I mean we have to remember our children are human too, and they need to be treated how we need to be treated. So whatever you want in life, you know you got to show. What you want in respect it's the law of attraction you yeah. put out there and you get it back so in Islam we only talk about law of attraction in the last 10 for 20 years but it's been in Islam for a long time you know it says you got to show yourself your children respect mm. they have their rights as well mm -hmm. you know it, you are not just there to just you know have babies after babies and then that's it there's a responsibility for that comes with it. Mm. And it's not just about giving them a good name, giving them, you know, uh, security and safety and, you know, the right psychology. It's about, you know, the conduct that you are with them in which you actually, you know, raise yourself and don't get angry with them. You know, d show them and discipline them in the most positive way. Mm. So there's positive discipline. And when you discipline them with love and kindness, saying that if you do something wrong, you will be in trouble but I'm the one person that's going to help you and I'm the one person that you can turn to to support you so that they know that they will come to you knowing that they've done something and you, they're going to get told off but at the same time Does you're the one to pick them up yeah. exactly yeah. and the respect will be there when you're honest with them when you're open with them and you keep your promise children mm. take it to heart every single thing that you say you know they rely on and they look upon their parents with so much you know neediness with so much you know that they require especially when they're young mm. and when you want your older kids to respect parents and to come to you they're not going to come to you if you didn't show them and invest in them at the beginning it's even in business you have to invest so yes. your legacy are your children it's not the business that you're going to build. It's not the big house that you're going to buy. It is the time and the effort and the love and the conduct and the virtues that you're going to show them. And when you show them from a young age, they will show you when they're older. And that's how it's carried forward to adulthood. And they don't, you don't have to tell them that, oh, you've got to respect your parents. They automatically will come to you because the love is you know, it's been given to them, so they're going to give it back to you. You know, it's like you respected them as, as, as children. Yeah. Uh, you respected the fact that when you promised something, you you uh, you ensured you that it. you kept it. Um, so it's always, it's again, the small things, isn't it? Of course it is. Yeah. And it's not just the one thing. You know, the most simplest lie and the most simplest promise mm. makes a big difference. And they remember that. They remember it. They remember that. They remember it for years to come mm. as well. Mm. So... It's not about being there all the time because I know people always say we're not there all the time, we're working moms, but then there are dads that also have to be there. They also have a part to play mm -hmm. and they do have a part and they do play a part a lot of the times. Um, and they're not there all the time, but they can make an even bigger impact because it's what they're putting into it yeah. and how they're putting into it. So the conversations that they have, the games that they play, you know, the interaction that they have, you know, all these things make a big difference and that creates love and it creates that connection and it creates that the respect that you're going to have for each other mm. because of the way in which you talk to one another mm. and if there's something that goes wrong you know you've got to know the skills of how to set that straight you've got to be strict 
Mm. You can't just love, you know, because you're working and you've got to spoil them. You can't just love because you've got to be strict because this is what the religion said. The religion does not say these things. There is a balance and you've got to figure out what that balance is so that it's according to the child's development stage. It's according to what the Islam says and the psychology that you need to be in. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have one more question and it's from an anonymous person and it says, how do I deal with my children who are coming of age when interacting with their cousins of the opposite gender who are also coming of age? That's a very interesting question and we always have um, the religious factor that comes into it and there are very strict rules about that and when you say coming of age, let's just make it clear, it's about children that are like age 9, 10 who are either wearing hijab or about to wear hijab and obviously for boys it's a lot more older mm -hmm. but at the same time they need to be aware of the um, you know the differences that you know girls will you know will they will interact differently with boys and as parents as you know grandparents whoever relatives in the house I think a lot of the times we we know the rules that you know they shouldn't really be kept alone and you know when they play it should be where it's not so much physical involvement but you know, generally at that age, children are not aware of the things that we are aware of. Yeah. And if we're going to make it too obvious, and if we're also going to make them too separate, we can actually create something which isn't there. Trigger the awareness. And can't trigger we? the awareness. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's not healthy as well because they are still family, and it's innocence that you're taking mm. away from them. Yeah. So be careful how you do things, because if you put too much restrictions on them as well, like oh, they cannot sit together okay no one's gonna sit that close but they there's nothing wrong in sitting together Let's and we're sitting in as a car family or on the yeah. sofa watching something exactly there's nothing yeah. absolutely wrong and you're sitting in with, as a family you're together having dinner or you're watching television or you are looking at a game or whatever that may be there's absolutely no harm but when you put that restriction and when you go out into the real world we're living in the Western world and that happens then they're gonna think they're doing something wrong and they're not. Yeah. And also, it's a bit of a confusion uh, when it comes to coming of age because the children, uh, the girls are nine years old. Yes. Uh, whereas the boys are around 15 exactly. or something like that. So exactly. So when the girl is nine, the girl cousin who's nine, um, and the boy cousin who is also nine, um, it can get a bit confusing because the boy ha still has no idea. They have no idea. And, you know, they need to be children. They need to play. Yeah. Yeah. There's nothing wrong. In the times of my moms, in the times, you know, in the Ahlul Bayt, you know, they didn't put and make children to feel uncomfortable. They didn't make them feel that they were doing something wrong, yeah. you know? And you, the way you do it and the way you say it is not to make them feel like, oh, there's something there that's, you know, because that's their innocent mind. We have that mind that we, and then if you do it from a young age and they feel like they're doing something wrong when they go and sit in the train or the tube station or in school with their classmate, that they're gonna feel like, you know, a little bit odd. And then they'll do something which they think maybe at the age of 40 that is, you know, not appropriate because they're being so restricted from such a young age. Yeah. So you and need to be careful. And it can also be confusing, it can't it for children, because especially with cousins, because one minute they're allowed to play together, um, and then the one minute, the next minute, it's like no, you, you can't play with her anymore. You, you know, you can't sit too close to her anymore. I think, I think can it's it get confusing. No, the rules are there. Yes, you know, I understand that. You know, there shouldn't be any physical contact and they shouldn't be left alone. But it's the way in which you say it. You yeah. say it as if like you're protecting them. This is your older sister now. You know, she needs protecting, you know, and we all as humans need our private space. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I teach that not just to like, you know, you can't just teach that to, to uh, females. You've got to do that for boys as well. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. We all have our private space. They're doing it at secondary school exactly. now anyway. So, you know, if there is a sp personal space yes. that needs to be respected yeah. no matter what. And maybe that's the age that you can introduce that to, you mm -hmm. know, and say it in those terms that this is my personal space and this is what needs to be left you know, in, in that space and even mm. in play and even in any interaction and if it, you know, there needs to be that distance. Yeah. So you don't have to say in a way that, oh, they're doing something wrong and oh, pull them aside and you know, oh, you can't sit together or you can't play together and you know, and sit in between them and things like that. You know, it's, it's, it's explain to them, to exactly, their young minds. Exactly. What's it's young mind. Yeah, explain you young need mind. to understand. That's why it comes about. Empathy is not about, you know, showing sympathy. Sympathy is different. Empathy is about putting yourself in their shoes. Mm -hmm understanding what they're going through and there are stages to do it and there are ways to do it and you can actually make them wrong by even saying it in a bad way you can bring out something that they never thought of before yeah i mean if you suddenly start to tell a boy it's haram to sit next to your cousin yeah. because now she's wearing hijab or now she's nine he, he's just gonna 
completely not understand. They might even cry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and if they're in school, how are they going to understand that? Yeah, he'll, he'll go and play. Not, it's not about play showing. With his, uh, you know, respect is not just about parents and children. Mm -hmm. It's about other yeah. children with other children. Mm. Teach them respect between each other. Maybe that's a better way of showing it. You yeah. know, this personal space, giving people, you know, that sort of sense that they can play, but from a distance, which is actually better for them. So it's the way you, in which you explain it. So the Islamic factor does come in. There is definitely restrictions. There is definitely a difference when you reach that age. But the way in which you do it is so important. And don't forget, you have an adult mind. So, you know, don't put that adult mind of your thoughts into that child too soon. Yeah. Because yeah. it can have an adverse effect. Of course. Okay, Fahima, thank you very much for being here today. We've yeah. learned a lot and inshallah, you will be back with us soon. And thank you to our viewers. My salama. If you've been affected by the following topics raised in this episode, please contact your local GP or Fahima Muhammad on coachfm1 at hotmail.com.